Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. It's based on the sixth edition of our textbook called Parasitic Diseases, which has been out now since 1982. We're up to our sixth edition. And so what we've decided to do, Dr. Griffin and myself, is to introduce this book as an online course. It's open to anybody who wants to take these um, presentations and learn all about parasitic diseases, the kind that make you sick. My producer, uh, Dr. Vincent Racaniello, is off screen, but he's responsible for all of the nuance that makes this production look professional. So I owe him a, a vote of confidence and thanks for setting this all up for us to begin with. We'll take you through the world of human parasites. That is to say, these are organisms that infect humans. Dr. Daniel Griffin has an MD degree and a PhD degree, and he will be my co-host for this series. So without further ado, let's uh, start by introducing the subject. And it's very interesting that we should introduce it by the winner of a phrase that was solicited by Science Magazine from its readership. What is the most um, important thing you could say that happened over the last 100 years in terms of science and biology? They actually limited it to biology. And the winner that they chose was a phrase that says, successful systems attract parasites. So that's our motto. So we, as human beings, are the world's most successful system, as we will see. So here's what our book looks like. And in fact, for those that are not aware, you can actually download a free PDF copy of this by simply going online to Parasites Without Borders, finding the head of the menu, uh, menu that says PD 6th edition, click on it, and then you will see a, a page that comes up and it'll say, for a free copy, click here. I strongly recommend you doing this. You can have it on your Kindle. You can have it on your <coughs> cell phone. You can have it on your home computer. You can look at it anytime you want. It's obviously a companion to the sixth edition hard copy. The episodes that follow, there are 45 of them altogether, are based on what's present actually in the book. And we're going via that order. So the format for each presentation is as follows. There's an introduction where we sort of introduce the subject of whatever that is for that particular time. Then we touch on the history of discovery. We won't go into the depth of that, but there, of course, is a large history regarding how each one of these things became known to the medical world. We'll talk about the life cycle next. Then the cellular and molecular pathogenesis section will cover how the host and the parasite interact to produce disease or to limit the infection in the host. We'll talk about the clinical disease, of course, and that's where Dr. Griffin will come on and tell you about the details of what it's like to be a patient that harbors one of these pathogens. Finally, we'll discuss the diagnosis, the treatment, of course, the prevention and control or epidemiology, as the case may be. And then finally, we'll have a recommendation for you if you want to really learn more about this subject that we haven't covered, because what we're really giving you is a sort of a, 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 a thumbnail sketch of, of the way this presents in the real world. We can't give you all the details, of course, as we would like to, but you can learn more about those details, either, either by reading them in our textbook or following the references that we've listed at the end of each one of these presentations. So let's begin by asking the basic question, of course, and that is, what is a parasite? You can define this any way you want. A lot of people have their own version of that definition. But actually, the one that fits the best for all of the organisms out there that cause illness in humans is a parasite is any organism that takes metabolic advantage of another organism. They can be a virus, which is the smallest unit of infection that we know of except for the prion. It could be rickettsia, which are bacteria-like organisms, but not quite as sophisticated in terms of their biochemistry. Of course, bacteria. And all of those taken together uh, represent what we would call uh, organisms without a nucleus or prokaryotes. It's before 
the nucleus arose in evolutionary history. But everything after that that I'll discuss, fungi, protozoa, helminths, and a few arthropods as well, all contain nuclei. And those nuclei enable us to categorize those organisms as eukaryotic organisms. And so parasitic diseases covers the breadth and depth of that subject of eukaryotic parasites. So how large a problem is the problem facing humanity of encountering eukaryotic parasites? So I show you in front of you a, a map or a schematic map of the, of the world as far as we know. All of the land masses are shown. And wherever people live on those land masses, we find parasites, which is quite amazing, actually. So one of the examples that I think we're all familiar with, at least we've heard of this before, is malaria. So where would we find malaria, for instance, throughout the world? <clears throat> and this map shows you vividly in colors that the redder the color, the more intense the infection. So it's called a heat map. So the redder the infection, <clears throat> <clears throat> Africa happens to be the reddest of the continents because a lot of malaria is found there. The next most common place for finding that is, as you can see, in Pakistan and India and throughout the Middle East. There's very little in the Middle East because there's very little water. And because this is a mosquito-borne infection, you need water for this to be transmitted. But we see a lot of it throughout the tropics. And so we consider malaria as a tropical disease. In 2015, there were roughly 212 million cases of malaria throughout the world. Now, the population of the earth is about 7.3 billion. So these are, this is a large proportion of that number that encounter malaria virtually every year. With 429,000 deaths, it's... Compared to the number of cases, it has a very low mortality rate. But when you add up all the number of cases, of course, it's one of the largest reasons why a person would die from an infectious disease. Malaria is still one of those great unsolved problems that we'll be discussing. On the other side of the spectrum of eukaryotic parasites, we have the worms. And everywhere where you see the blue color is an endemic center for worm transmission. And these worms are found, as you can see, throughout most of the tropical and subtropical and even temperate zone uh, world, depending upon the level of sanitation that we find there. These are just the ones that are transmitted by fecal contamination of soil. So they're called geohelminths for that reason, because the feces contaminates the soil. The soil then contaminates things like water and the food that we grow and crops. We harvest them, we bring those stages of the infection to our table, and we ingest them. And that's why so many people have these parasites. Most of the parasitic infections that we'll be discussing, although not all, are limited to places considered to be less developed. We have less developed and least developed countries, as they're classified now by the uh, United Nations. And we see, of course, a preponderance of infection in the places which are considered to be the least developed. Therefore, the sanitation is, is rather primitive, if at all existing. So therefore, the people that are forced to live in these places, most of them are forced to live in these places, uh, encounter these parasites on a daily basis. As a result, they are the highest number of people infected throughout the world. If you want to know where to go to find a lot of parasitic infections, just go to the least developed countries and you'll find them. So you could ask a question, of course, throughout the whole world, why are there so many parasitic infections? When you add them up, it's like two or three billion people's worth of infection. And the answer is quite simple. Because when humans evolved out of Africa and spread throughout the world, they occupied virtually every landmass that, that was possible to get to. And they settled there. Some continued to explore, of course, but others remained. So as a result, we live everywhere. And because we live someplace, we've got to eat. And therefore, it turns out that we'll eat anything that crawls or swims or flies or grows. And many people who live in places which are compromised in terms of their sanitation 
are forced to drink water because we drink 2.3 liters of water every day. Because of that need, we often drink contaminated water that's contaminated with feces that has stages of these infections, as we will see, that are easily transmitted from person to person. So that's sort of the opening salvo for parasitic diseases. Um, and here's a good example of, of how these parasites are being transmitted from one person to another. What we see here is a typical green garden somewhere in Asia. And because most people living in compromised situations, that is financially compromised or politically compromised, or just because their level of economics is, is lower than most of the world, they are forced to use the most common sources for things that you and I would hardly think of using. In one case, if you want to make those plants grow, you've got to fertilize them. So what do you think they use for fertilizer? They use a combination of urine and feces. And it turns out to be human urine and human feces. Together, they make a wonderful growth medium for green plants. But they also transmit the stages of infections that are present in those people from person to person. They end up on these green grocers' shelves. They have, in most cases, been washed to make them look fresh and palatable. But in reality, that could serve as a warning that you should stay away from these because it contains the water of that little creek that you saw next to this green grocer, green grower rather, and it ends up uh, again in inducing people to eat things that uh, ultimately they um, they shouldn't have eaten. There are some places which are so compromised that the children and young adults are forced to eat, let's say, one or two meals a day. And these meals are heavily contaminated with their environment. And you see these two children sitting on the ground sharing a meal. Lord knows what's in that bowl, but uh, it probably isn't something that would make them healthier. It probably would take away from their sense of well-being. And it could very well contain the stage of a parasite that we'll be discussing later in this presentation. So if the soil base doesn't get you, and if the water-borne <laughs> infections don't get you, then perhaps something will fly or crawl or land on you and inject something into you or deposit something on your skin, which could then result in an infection. We call these arthropod-borne vectors. So arthropods are jointed-legged animals. Uh, some of them are insects. Some of them are arachnids. The ones you see depicted here are all insects. They have six legs. Some of them fly. Some of them crawl. It depends on what stage they're at. But all of the ones shown here transmit what I would consider to be major health-altering um, infections, many of which have proven lethal. And so controlling the vectors is a, is a way of, of controlling these infections rather than looking at drugs or vaccines. Uh, we have lots of intervention strategies which take advantage of the fact that we can limit how many of these arthropods are in our uh, area of, of where we live. Now, the format, as um, Dr. Dave Palmier was, um, was presenting, is going to follow really the same format as our book. So introduction, history, life cycle, um, cellular and molecular pathogenesis. But then when we get to clinical disease, diagnosis and treatment. I'm going to jump in. We'll start with a clinical vignette. Um, I will try to point out a little bit about the features. We'll then move on to um, diagnosis. And then finally, we're going to finish with uh, treatment. And then we'll return to Dr. De Pommier for a discussion of prevention epidemiology and where one might go to learn more. As far as the approach to the patient, um, you know, in most of these cases, you're going to know. You're in the chapter, you're going to know what the, what the case is. Um, but I'm always going to suggest that people be thinking as I present the case about how we, how we focus, how we make the diagnosis, how we're ultimately going to um, figure this out. Should we not know going into it what it is? And we'll break things down into chief complaints, different presentations, and a little bit on how a clinician might approach this. Now, for instance, um, fever, 
rash, skin lesion, eosinophilia, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, general problems, respiratory complaints, mental health issues. These are different ways that we start off and then kind of move forward. So let, let me just take a couple of these to talk to you about them. Um, one of the issues with fever. So when a patient presents with fever, um, how do we approach this? We might ask whether it's localizing. We might also ask whether it's life-threatening. We might say in the tropics first, is it malaria or sepsis? We wanna know, do we have time to think about this or do we need to really start moving quickly here? Um, second, does it localize? Are there any clues? Does this seem to be primarily a pulmonary complaint, a gastrointestinal complaint, something coming from the urinary symptoms, uh, stiff neck, maybe rash? Now rash, as I mentioned, sometimes this is gonna be something that comes in the context of a fever, sometimes it presents all by itself. Sometimes the chief diagnosis is, I have a skin complaint. Um, and in this, in this context, we're gonna be asking, where is the skin problem? Um, what kind of a skin problem is it? Is it diffuse? Is it papular? Is it vesicular? Is it scaly? As we'll get, does it have a breathing hole? An odd question, but by the end, I think you'll understand why we wanna know that. Is it serpiginous? Does it look like a snake? Um, is it migratory? Is it moving? And sometimes with parasites, that is an unfortunately upsetting. Now, what about eosinophilia? This is gonna come up. We're gonna talk about how we approach that. And this will be a, a clue in certain times that there are certain uh, pathogens that might be on our radar or should be on our radar. Um, but again, eosinophilia, we're gonna go back to some of the same questions as we do with fever. Does it localize? Is this a person with eosinophilia and pulmonary complaints, gastrointestinal complaints? urinary complaints, a stiff neck, a rash. And then where is this person uh, coming to us from? Where might they have acquired this infection and what is common in this geographical location? So the next time we're gonna talk about an uh, introduction to eukaryotic parasites and we'll go through the protozoans and the helminths to show you the variety and, and, and the perhaps something of their lifestyles as well. Thank you for listening.